first epistle of John, chapter 1. Briefly, a review. Why the review? Repetition is the key to retention. You can remember anything you want to remember. Some people say, I'm too old to memorize. You can memorize anything you want. Just keep repeating it. What's the license number on your car? You say, I don't know. Every time you get into your car, repeat it out loud. After eight or ten times, you'll never forget it. Repetition is the key to retention. So in teaching, it's always good to review, to repeat, and it brings us up to date in that constant review. It becomes a part of us, and we don't so soon forget it. We open by discussing the writer of this epistle, the penman who wrote it. And we were pretty much agreed that the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel record and the book of the Revelation, wrote these three epistles. Question number two, to whom was it written? And we learned that it was written to God's dear children, his little children, his born-again ones. It's a family letter from the Father to the members of his family, whom he calls my little children or my dear children children. Thus, it's a general letter for all believers, not written to a specific local assembly nor to a particular individual, but to all of us who are in the family. So we notice then to whom it was written. Now we learn two things there, how we can identify with those born again ones. And we trace the little word born through the epistle to see the earmarks, the evidences of the born-again ones, the birthmarks of the born-again ones. And we learned that we can test ourselves, find out if we have been born again if we measure up to the requirements in those texts containing the word born. Now, we moved on to question number three. Why was the epistle written? What were the divinely stated reasons for the writing of the letter? And so we discover that there are a number of verses which very clearly tell us, and you don't even have to be a grammar school graduate to get it, where John said, these things write I unto you, or I have written unto you, and he goes on to tell us why. Now the only verse in which you do not find the word write or written is in verse 3. It was written first to proffer fellowship. Chapter 1, verse 3. Now we come to the second divinely stated purpose for the writing of the epistle, and you will find it in verse 4. From here on, every verse telling us why it was written contains the word write or the word written. Verse 4. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now please notice the order here. This is very simple. But when God wrote the Bible, dear people, he wrote it for common people, and he wrote it to be understood. Now just look at it and you'll see. Notice the order. The fullness of joy does not precede the fellowship. We cannot have the joy of a believer if we are not a believer. So we have to be in the fellowship first. We have to be in the family first. We have to be... A, a partner with God, a partaker of God's nature first, then the joy follows. A non-Christian can never have Christian joy. Why? He's not in the family yet. So the first divinely stated reason is that, hey, get into the fellowship. This is a great fellowship. It's a wonderful family. We have no color distinctions, no racial distinctions, no denominational distinctions. We are God's born ones. We have a common Father and a common Savior, and we lay aside our little petty differences because there's too much at stake. Are you in the family? All right, now you're ready for the second purpose. These things write I unto you that your joy may be full. Now, it may appear to be unfortunate at the outset that one of the reasons for the writing of the epistle is that the Christian may have the fullness of joy, and yet this is the only appearance of the word joy in all five chapters. You don't find it two times. So you begin to wonder, how can I find out the source of this joy? Well, 
Look how the verse begins. These things. Which things? Well, the things in the epistle. The truths in the epistle. They were written that the members of the family of God should have the fullness of joy. The word joy is a translation of the Greek word kara, C-H-A-R-A. We have a great granddaughter. Our grandson is a missionary in Ethiopia, and uh, we have two and a half great grandchildren. And uh, our granddaughter, they named her Kara, which means joy. And when God gave uh, that little girl to Steve and Marcia, they received that little girl from the Lord and said, this could be the joy of our lives. And so they call her Kara. So we have a great granddaughter who has a Greek name, Kara, meaning joy. That word means delight or gladness. It's a pleasurable excitement or emotion that comes to one either through expectation, something we're looking forward to, or something that has already happened. Now, it's not merely happiness. You can be happy and not have Christian joy. Some people are happy with money. Give them plenty of money and enough health to spend it and enjoy the money. They're happy, but they may not have the joy of the Lord. That's something different. It's the joy that is in a spiritual realm. It relates to things for Christian joy. There was a man on our street who came home drunk quite regularly. And you always knew when he was coming home, no matter what hour of the day or night, he would come down the street singing, think, happy. Now, he wasn't that way when he was sober. But when he got drunk, now people get violent when they get drunk. I mean that. Abusive. Foul language. This man, he, he couldn't be happy any other way. So he kept drinking because that gave him a happy spirit. Now, he had happiness, but he didn't have the joy of the Lord. You see, there's a difference. Happiness depends on happenings. Joy depends on one's relationship to Jesus. You see, talking about Christian joy, the joy of the Lord. It's a spiritual experience. And it comes to us, this exciting, pleasurable experience comes to us sometimes as we anticipate or expect something wonderful to happen as a believer. Paul used it in connection with people he had led to the Lord. For example, in Philippians chapter 4, he speaks to those whom he had led to Christ, the Lydia, the businesswoman, and... Uh, in Philippi and the Philippian jailer and any in his family who were saved, Paul said, you are my joy. He had led them to Christ. They constituted his joy. There's great joy, spiritual joy, when you have the privilege of sharing in someone coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is the kind of joy he's talking about spiritual experience, a pleasurable, exciting experience that's related to the Lord to the Lord's work, to the Lord's people. Keep in mind, Christian joy is not mere happiness. This, incidentally, brings me to uh, Luke chapter 15. Will you turn for a moment to Luke 15 in your Bible? Luke chapter 15. There's an interesting parable here in uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 3. And he spake this parable unto them, saying... What man of you having an hundred sheep, if ye lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders. What's the next word? Rejoicing. Now what's the application? Now a sheep is a sheep. But in the parable, a sheep means a person, human being. How do you know that? Well, let's read on. Verse 6. When he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, What? Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was what? Now he's going to apply it. You say, a sheep is a sheep. Yeah, a sheep is a sheep, but in the parable, the sheep is a person. How do you know that? Verse 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. That's the bottom line of the parable. That's the punchline. That's the application. A sheep is a person in the parable. See? Now, let's go to the coin, verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver or coins, if she lose one piece, she lights a candle, sweeps the house, seeks diligently till she finds it. When she has found it, she calls her friends, her neighbors together, saying what? 
Rejoice! Now watch the application. The coin represents a person. Coin is a coin, but it's a person in a parable. How do you know? Verse 10. Likewise I say unto you, here's the bottom line, here's the punchline, here's the application. I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over what? One sinner that repented. There's joy. This is real joy, beloved, when a sinner gets saved. See, different from happiness. We can find happiness in many things, but Christian joy, there are many reasons for it, many sources of Christian joy. Just pointed out a couple here by way of introduction. Now, inasmuch as the word joy does not appear in the first epistle of John, we could have some difficulty in finding out which things John is talking about. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now, all Christians have at times a measure of joy, but I'm not so sure that we all have the fullness of joy that we don't have it and we can't express it at all times under all circumstances and all conditions, sometimes we lose our joy, don't we? Uh, the bottom drops out of our plans, the roof caves in on our plans. We find ourselves sitting in a tunnel and we can't see daylight at the end of the tunnel. We find ourselves in a valley and we couldn't imagine that there was ever a valley so deep and suddenly our joy goes because... Our plans have been shattered. What's wrong? We don't have the fullness of joy. Now John said, I'm writing unto you that you don't lose your joy. These things write I unto you that your joy may be full. Now, in order to understand this text here, I'm going to take you back to the gospel according to John. And I want to show you one of the internal evidences in these two books that John wrote the first epistle. Turn back, please, to the very familiar, the very familiar 15th chapter of the Gospel according to John. The 15th chapter. While you're turning to chapter 15 of John, did you know that in our Lord's Prayer, now the Lord's Prayer is John 17. It's not the Our Father prayer in Matthew. The Lord never prayed that prayer. May I repeat that? The prayer in Matthew, Our Father which art in heaven, is not the Lord's prayer. The Lord never prayed that prayer. He never will pray that prayer. He never could pray that prayer. Why? Because in that prayer there is a request for the forgiveness of sins, and the Lord never had any sins. Forgive us our sins. He never prayed that prayer. He couldn't pray it. He's teaching His disciples the principles of the prayer life. It's not his prayer. Now, the Lord's prayer is in John 17. That's the prayer our Lord prayed. And in John chapter 17, verse 13, one of the things he prayed for is that his disciples, his followers, would have fullness of joy. He says, Oh, Father, give to them the joy, thy joy. Now, he backed that up, by the way, in his life. For we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. How could he find joy in looking forward to the cross? Because that was the will of the Father. He prayed three times, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He subjected himself to the will of the Father, and doing the will of the Father, he found joy even in suffering who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Friends, if our joy goes out the window when a trial comes into our lives, we better check up. We better check up. What do we count on for genuine joy? The so-called good things of life? Money? Health? Pleasure? That's not joy. That's a happiness that comes to the unsaved as well as to the saved. Any unbeliever can be happy. But only a child of God doing the will of God can have the joy of the Lord. Now, your Bible's open to John chapter 15. This is a very familiar chapter, but I would like to read some verses for you and then make a comment, and this will throw light on 1 John 1.4. 
Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because it's so. It's in the context. Now, let me, uh, let me begin by giving you verse 11 of John 15. Let's start with verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you. Does that sound familiar? John said in 1 John 1, 4, These things, right, I unto you. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. That sound familiar? That's what 1 John 1, 4 is saying. Where'd John get that? Well, the Spirit of God gave it to him, but he's getting it from the Lord Jesus. Now, John was the one who leaned on the bosom of our Lord, very close to the Lord Jesus. So in 1 John 1, 4, he's really reiterating what our Lord taught in the Gospel record. Now, let's go back and see what these things are. Verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I'm going to read from verse 1. Now, I'm going to put emphasis on a particular word, and every time I come to it, if you have your ballpoint pen, just underline it in your Bible. Every time you read John 15, that'll pop right out at you. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Now, Verse 11, these things have I spoken. Which thing? It's right there in the context. Now the word abide is the translation of a little Greek word anglicized in four letters, M-E-N-O, meno. You'll find it frequently in your Bible. The word meno means to continue, to persevere, to remain. Now what's he saying? If you continue in fellowship with me, if you remain constant, if you persevere, you will be a fruit-bearing Christian. And if you do that, the joy of the Lord will be your portion. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. The secret, well, it's right here in the context. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, if you obey me, if you don't break fellowship with me, remember now, 1 John 1, 3, the first reason for writing the letter was to proffer fellowship. Am I in the family? Am I in the fellowship? Or, now, am I continuing in communion with the Lord, or have I broken fellowship with Him? Did I let sin come into my life? Not the relationship, but the fellowship. Fellowship can be broken. Relationship can never be broken. You see... Once you're born into God's family, you can't be unborn out of God's family. I'm a member of the Strauss family. I could change my name to Steinberg. But that won't change my relationship to my father and mother. I'm still the son of Joseph and Pearl Strauss by birth. Suppose my father and I have an out and we're not on speaking terms. And I leave home and go live somewhere else. Am I still the son of Mr. and Mrs. Strauss? Sure. What was broken? My fellowship or my relationship? fellowship. Why? I was born into the Strauss family. I can't be unborn out of it. You can't be unborn once you're born. Now, here's a sinner comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, born again, born into the family of God. The Lord Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do we Christians sin? Yes. What has been broken? Our fellowship or our relationship? The fellowship. You can't break the relationship. Once you're born, you can't be unborn. You see, it's a beautiful truth, dear people. Beautiful truth. Now, 
We'll tell you what to do with that sin when we come to the next reason for the writing of the epistle, to prevent sin. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. But to abide in the Lord is to remain in unbroken communion with Him. Don't let sin break the fellowship, not the relationship, the fellowship. Don't let sin break that. Now, if you do keep His commandments, then your joy, verse 11, will be full. Now, tell me, class, what is the key word that I pointed out to you in John 15, 1 to 11? Abide. Got that? Now, turn back to 1 John. Now, you can see 1 John here in verse 11. These things write I unto you, that you might, my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. Now, go back to 1 John, if you will, please. Let's take this little word, abide. It's repeated frequently in this epistle. Now, the word joy only once. But John 15, 1 to 11, throws light on 1 John. Has anyone ever told you that the Bible is a self-interpretive book? The Bible explains the Bible. You can see this. This is a simple illustration, but it happens again and again and again. You just keep reading and you keep studying, and the difficult passage, after a while, you get some light on it from another passage of Scripture. That's called comparing Scripture with Scripture, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's why we need to study the whole Bible, not our pet passages or our favorite books. We need to study. Paul said, I declared unto you the whole counsel of God. He didn't have the New Testament. It wasn't written yet, but he preached and taught all that he had, the whole counsel of God. So we need to study the whole Bible because the Bible throws light on the Bible. Dr. J. Sidlow Baxter, with his quaint little English accent, whom we have all loved and appreciated, he used to say, and he had a sort of a sweet, nice way of saying it. He's saying, now, my dears, the best book to interpret the book is the book. <laughs> the best book to interpret the book is the book. Now, men write books to help people whose lives are not given to study. That's why we write books. First to help ourselves, and then to help others. My whole life is devoted to studying, teaching the Bible. Yours is not. Many of you have a very busy work-a-day world waiting for you when you get back home. You'll be up to your ears in it. Don't neglect the Bible. Now, you'll never find time to read and study your Bible. You'll have to make time. You're going to have to discipline yourself to make it. The Bible explains the Bible. Let's see this principle in the first epistle of John. First, chapter 2, verse 6. Now, remember, in chapter 1, I pointed out three verses beginning with the words, If we say, 6, 8, and 10. Then in chapter 2, I pointed out three verses beginning with the phrase, He that saith. Verses 4, 6, and 9. Look at verse 6. He that saith, He abideth. It's a little word, meno. Continues, perseveres in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. You say, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you in fellowship with him, though? Are you, did sin break your fellowship, or are you walking in communion with him? Now, if you are abiding in him, continuing, that's the meaning of the word, remaining, continue. We'll show you that in a moment. If you're continuing, then you will walk as he walked. How did he walk? He walked in obedience to the Father, and in his deepest suffering, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was joy to look forward to the cross. Why? That was God's will for his life. Excuse the reference, it's a personal illustration, but after 50 years of a marriage that had no trials, no sorrow, no heartaches, no sickness, 50 years after we had celebrated that 50th anniversary, Hey, friends, the roof caved in, and the bottom dropped out. And for the first time in my Christian experience, I found myself being put to the test. Would I lose my joy? 
That didn't mean I'd never weep. We, we weep. We have our times of tears, even yet. Doesn't mean we've lost our joy. The Lord Jesus wept. He was a man of sorrows, but he never lost his joy, even in the deepest time of suffering. It was joyful to look forward to the cross. Why? It was the will of the Father. For, for just a moment, in this connection, and so much comes to mind when you think of these great truths, turn to 2 Corinthians for just a moment, chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me show you one of the many paradoxes in the Bible. Not contradictions. There are no contradictions. There are many paradoxes in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now watch this. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Hey, can you reconcile that? That doesn't make sense to the average person. Great trial of affliction and abundance of joy. How can anyone have an abundance of joy going through a great trial of affliction? Only if we are abiding, continuing day by day in unbroken fellowship with Him. We don't lose our joy when trials come. By the way, there's another paradox in that same verse. Great trial of affliction, abundance of joy. Look at the second one. Their deep poverty and their liberality. That's a paradox. How can someone in deep poverty be liberal? That's a paradox. You can't explain that. Our minds cannot rationalize deep poverty and liberality. We cannot rationalize great sorrow and abundance of joy, but it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Not our joy, not happiness, depending on happenings, but our relationship to the Lord Jesus. We're abiding in Him. So mark that first abide in the first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 6. Now look at verse 10. He that loveth his brother, what's the next word? He's abiding in the light. You see, if, I'm, if I can't love my brother in Christ or my sister, no matter how ornery they are, no matter how much they take a poke at me, then it's suggesting that maybe I'm not in fellowship with the Lord. See, it's not what my brother or sister in Christ does to me or says to me, it's the way I react to it. If I can't love them in spite of what they're doing to me, then maybe I have the problem. You see, I'm not in communion, not in fellowship. I'm not abiding. So mark that word abide in verse 10. You see how John 15 is throwing light on this great purpose for writing the epistle in the first epistle of John. Now look at verse 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong in the word of God. What makes us spiritually strong? We continue in the Word, and the Word abides in us. Mark that word abide. Now move down to verse 17. The world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God, what's the next word? Abideth forever. That's in verse 17. Look at verse 19. Now here are the mere professors, those phonies, who say they have fellowship with God. John said they went out, from us, but they were not of us. But if they had been of us, they would no doubt have, what's the next word, continued. Now get ready, that's the same Greek word meno, translated to by. So the little word meno has several translations in the New Testament, and they're all accurate. To remain, or to continue, and to abide have the same connotation. To continue, to abide, to remain, to stay put. Don't be up today, down tomorrow, jack in a box. Don't be a yo-yo Christian. You know, up and down, up and down, up and down. Speaking of yo-yos, I was in a store. No, really, it was called a Christian bookstore. And they had more gadgets that they called Christian. They had a Christian yo-yo. Yeah, I'm serious. A lady said, do you have those Christian yo-yos? It had a verse of scripture on it. A lady came in and said, 
do you have Christian ashtrays? The woman said, no. She said, oh, you don't have an ashtray with a verse of scripture on it? You know, Christian ashtray. How do we get on that? Yo-yo. Yeah. All right, now we, uh, we hit that verse uh, 19. The word continue is the word meno. Same little Greek word, meno. Now look at verse 24. Let that therefore... What's the next word? Meno. Remain. Which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain... Same Greek word, meno. Now watch it. It's translated three different ways in one verse, and it's the same Greek word. The word abide, the word remain, ye also shall continue. Mark those three words, abide, remain, continue. Translation of a common Greek word, meno. What does it mean to abide? To remain, to continue, to stay in unbroken fellowship with the Lord. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Verse 4 of chapter 1 follows logically, spiritually, progressively out of verse 3. As I am in fellowship with my Lord, then my joy remains constant. It continues, it remains, it abides. Chapter 3, verse 6. We won't have time for all the abides, but here's one more. Whosoever abideth in him, notice the E-T-H, present continuous tense, whosoever continues in unbroken fellowship with him will not continue to practice sin. We will sin, and we'll deal with that in our next study. But we won't continue to practice sin. We'll do with our sins what the Bible tells us to do. We'll confess them and we'll forsake them. If we are in the family, and if we don't confess them and forsake them, what then? We're going to deal with the most difficult text in 1 John, the sin unto death. Now... Let's uh, look at some of the grounds for Christian joy. Some of the grounds for Christian joy. What causes believers to rejoice? If they're in fellowship with the Lord now. We have nothing between our soul and the Savior. How many of you remember that old song? Nothing between my soul and my Savior. That was written by a black preacher in Philadelphia who also wrote... A great old song, Take Your Burden to the Lord and Leave It There. A black preacher, I heard him preach. What a preacher. Shortly after I was saved, I was saved 58 years ago, I heard that dear man preach. Oh, how he could preach. Great hymn writer, too. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. That's abiding. What happens when I sin? Confess it. Forsake it. Get rid of it. Get back into fellowship. God wipes the slate clean. Get a fresh start. And your joy comes back. The joy comes back. Let's look at it. In the life of a man who really knew the Lord and sinned. Turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I was going to ask, to ask you to turn to some scriptures for the ground for joy. But let's get cleared on this matter of sin first. Psalm 51 was written by David after he broke two commandments. Two of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments that God gave to the nation of Israel. One was, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number two, thou shalt not kill or murder. And David committed both of them. One evening he was on the balcony of his palace and he looked out and saw a woman having her, could have been her, what we would call her shower, her evening shower, or evening bath. It could have been a religious ceremony, some oblation of some sort, a religious washing. The Bible isn't clear, but she was having some kind of a washing. Apparently, she was unclothed. And David looked, and he was attracted to her. And uh, instead of turning away and asking the Lord for victory, he kept looking and kept looking, and the more he looked, the more he lusted. And being the king and having authority, he made contact with this woman, got involved and committed adultery with her, and she became pregnant. Now he's guilty of violating a very important commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now he's in a jam. The one sin leads to another, so he decided to 
arranged through the officials, the generals in his army, to place this woman's husband in a position in the battle where he'd be sure to be killed. That would make her a widow, and then he'd get out of the jam. But uh, he's now guilty of adultery and murder. But you see, God keeps the records. How foolish to think nobody will find it out. <laughs> be sure your sin will find you out, and mine too. If not by people, <laughs> by God. And God sent David's pastor to visit him. And I tell you, when the king is one of your flock, and you have to go and tell him about his sin, that's a tough assignment. And Nathan went to King David, and he told him a little story, and boy, David got angry. He said, a man that would do something like that, he ought to be dealt with. And the pastor said, thou art the man. And David was caught. And he wrote Psalm 51 after he committed those sins. I want to give it to you. Ready? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. He's dealing with his own sin now. Did you ever hear people pray like this? Lord, if we have sinned, forgive us our sins. Oh, come on. If we have sinned, forgive us ours. Hey, deal with your own sins. I deal with mine. I can't deal with yours. I don't know what they are. But I know what mine are. This man is dealing with his own sin. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And he goes on praying for the purging in verse 7, for the cleansing in verse 8. And in verse 8 he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Now look at verse 12. Restore unto me the what, class? He didn't lose his salvation. He lost the joy. You see what sin does? He lost the joy. He never was... You know, he was called a man after God's own heart. As a young Christian, that bothered me. How could God say, here's a man committing adultery and murder. Now he's called a man after God's own heart. Well, as I studied the life of David, I learned something very important. He confessed and forsook his sins and never went back to them. Hey, there's a fresh start for any of us. We confess it. We forsake it. Now, we can break that communion. We may not continue consistently, but we'll come back to that in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. But the point here is, he lost his joy. And he was aware of that. The joy had gone out of his life. Sin had come in. No joy. You say, no pleasure. Oh, I'm sure there was pleasure in that relationship with Bathsheba. No one will deny that. But that kind of pleasure was sinful pleasure. And it took the joy out of his life. Don't be fooled, dear people. There is pleasure in sin. There is happiness in sinning, but it will take the joy of the Lord out of our lives. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. What's the secret? Abiding? Stay put, remain, continue. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. There's a great text in Philippians and gave me one of my best sermons, which I don't preach anymore. I, I'm going to someday, but I haven't for a long time. Here's the text, you preachers. This will preach, I guarantee you. It's Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's a great text. The first word and the last word in the text, the same. Rejoice. So point one of my sermon was the stress on rejoicing. The verse begins with rejoice and concludes with rejoice. 
the stress on rejoicing. My second point was the source of rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord. Not in your circumstances. Our joy is in the Lord. The source of rejoicing. And my third point was the season for rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord when? Always. And oh, I preached that. Numbers of times in conferences. And it went over big. It was one of my sugar sticks. There was another summer Bible conference in America. There were three vice presidents present at that conference. Three vice presidents. I preached one morning on Philippians 4.4. 4. Boy, that thing went over. That, oh, man, that was a great message. At night, I was doing the life of Abraham with the films of the Genesis Project. Excellent, 16 millimeter sound colored films. I would teach and then show the film. Now, the films cost me $1,200. I bought them, I owned them. I said to the director of the conference, do you have a 16 millimeter projector? Oh, yeah, we got a good one. Do you have anybody who knows how to run it? Oh, yeah, he said, we have a young man here on staff. He's run it many times. I said, I have some expensive films, and uh, I'm going to use one each night for the Abraham series. No problem. Well, the young man who was running the machine really didn't know much about it. And he did not thread my film properly didn't get the sprockets in the holes. And he started up the film, and it's ripped on my very expensive. That one film cost me $300. And uh, I, I tell you, friends, I, I really got churned up. And I showed it. I showed it. And one of the vice presidents slipped up behind me when I was reacting rather poorly to that $300 film having to be replaced. He slipped up behind me and whispered, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. I haven't preached that sermon since. You know, it's not easy to, to live it. But when we are in unbroken communion with the Lord, we can take these things better. And that was a lesson to me. So I'm not ready to preach it again, but hopefully someday I might... You know, I'm just hoping that I might come along far enough. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. May God help us to walk in communion with Him so that the joy of the Lord will really be our strength for this day.